We're about ready to get started, aren't we, Chris? I think so. I was waiting for the clock to quote roll over to seven here. It's at six fifty-nine. So. So, yes, I think let's let's go ahead and get started. Um, Kevin, are you ready, recording wise? I am. I'm ready. All right. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody. Looks like right now we've got 40 participants. That's pretty darn good for a team meeting. Um, I hope everybody is safe and healthy and staying that way. I'm sure everybody's ready to get away from their houses a little bit. I know I am. Um, I'm going to go through some notes tonight and go through some shop criteria that will be kind of um, will be under some special criteria when we get the shop back open and I'll read through some of those criteria as we know it right now that that's kind of liquid and could change a little bit. Um, Effie's going to offer us a safety minute after my announcement and then we'll go right into the demonstration and Jack's done a great job of trying to set his shop up so that He's got video in the right spot to kind of walk us through through his his demo tonight. So that being said, um, I'd like to welcome our our visitors and our any new members that are out there online. I don't know that I'm going to go around and try to find everybody, but um, I know for you're a visitor from Texas. It's nice to see you and meet you. Thank you. I uh, hope you enjoy our meeting tonight. Glad to be here. Uh, wanted to let everybody know that Larry Randolph, who did a um, demonstration for our club in March, March in April, um, was really displeased. He was having some video issues. I know it was a little frustrating. I, I accepted a lot of it as IT issues that I can't do any better so I don't question people when they're dealing with this kind of thing but he is uh, was very apologetic to Mike and it, uh, more or less demanded that he have an opportunity to do another demonstration so Mike has set him up for next month's demonstration for the monthly meeting um, and he will uh, Try to make up for some of the the problems he was having with the video and stuff during his original meeting. If you're a first time visitor, please uh, consider a contribution to the club. I think we we asked for like a ten dollar donation the last time. If you've already donated the last time, by no means are you expected to donate again. It's just uh, this is more or less a make up meeting. Uh, to uh, make it a little better this time, hopefully. Um, this month, Jack, Jack Karstens is going to do uh, a multi-axis bowl demonstration that he kind of gave the board a little bit of a demo the other day on, on how he's going to present it, and I think it'll be uh, very well done. Jack does a good job with all of his presentations. Um, Right now, the the our shop is is going to remain closed. I'm not positive that it'll be all the way through the rest of the month, but there are some things that we've got to get uh, in line before we get everything open, including me getting in contact with all the openers and trying to get a um, consensus on who's comfortable opening and when they're comfortable opening so that we can determine if we've got any holes in, in the uh, calendar as far as what we used to have going on open shop. So there will be more coming on that. I apologize for not having a set date tonight, but I, I, I just think we're a little too premature to have a, a set date but we're getting there and the board's working towards trying to get that thing open as soon as possible. Um, when it does open, um, both the Saturday and the weekday night evening openings will be impacted by the COVID and by the restrictions that the city is putting out for us right now. 
Um, so there's going to be a, a little, uh, um, some criteria that we're going to put in place. It's nothing that you probably aren't familiar with hearing. Um, the criteria right now, as of right now, <coughs> will be a limit of 10 individuals in the shop. So I think we'll take a couple of the smaller lathes that uh, we'll put bags over them for right now so that nobody's using them. And I think if we do it correctly, then we should be able to bag two lathes have 10 lathes that are available and all of them are pretty much in a six foot distance between the turners. So I think we can get back in there and get to using the, the equipment pretty much the way it's set up. We might have a couple things we need to alter slightly, but our goal will be to keep things at a 10 person limit and the way they'll do that is um, like to have an uh, app on online that you can go in and sign up for the, the shop so that you have a way to check and see if the shop is going to be full before you head that direction and, and find out that it is. There will be an email go out once we have that uh, established and exactly where you can check in and how you, how you sign up. Um, it was a sign up genie, I think, Mark Inman. Uh, helped us get to a quick view of, of how that could be done. Um, might be a little cumbersome the first time or, or through it, but after that, I think everybody will get the, the point. You'll see a list with nine, nine uh, fillable spots. That's because the tenth spot would be the opener or the closer, uh, opener closer for that night. Um, so that would be the tenth person. We're going to ask that masks be worn at all times for the most part. I know there will be off, uh, times when you have to pull the mask off or whatever, but we want to be conscious that we're walking through the woodworker's space when we're entering and exiting the building, and they're going to be asking everybody to wear masks, so we're definitely expected to wear masks uh, as we enter and exit the building. and. The board will be asking that everybody wears a mask in, in our space, especially given how small a space that we really have. I think that'll be the best thing for right now that we can do. Um, we'll try our best to maintain social distancing. I don't think that means that we can't sit around the table um, and, and chat, but when we do, we'll probably have to spread ourselves out a little bit more and not have the as big of a crowd at the tables as, as we've had in the past. Now these things will hopefully lighten up as, as the different phases of, of the um, reoccupation. <laughs> I don't know how to call that right, but um, as we get uh, more information from the city and they lighten up their uh, restrictions, we'll lighten up the restrictions in the shop and, and try to get everybody comfortable with that. One of the other items that we'll be doing is uh, we'll we'll provide the board will will provide paper towels and some disinfectant, probably just like Clorox water or something like that. Spray on the paper towels, and after you, you're after you've cleaned up uh, the lathe in the lathe area after you've done work, we're just asking that you wipe down the handle. And not, if you've used several tools, if you could. Uh, wipe those tools down. Obviously, you've got a potential rust issue if you're leaving things wet, so please wipe them down and then dry them off and, and put them up on the rack or, or uh, do your best to just keep things safe for the next person that's coming to the lathe is the idea there. Um, right now, that's, that's generally the criteria that we'll have. Obviously, the social distancing, the keeping your hands washed. Um, one that wasn't listed but should have been was, if you're not feeling good, don't come into open shop. Nobody wants anything, even if it's not a COVID virus. We don't want any other viruses to be spread around through the shop either. So that um, pretty much goes through my, my announcements that I wanted to start out with tonight. Um, I, before Jack starts his demonstration for us tonight, I wanted to turn the mic over to Effie, and uh, Effie is going to give us his Effie's safety minute for this month. So, Effie, if you want to take it away, I'll mute myself. 
Okay, I'll mute all and you can uh, unmute whenever you uh, feel you want to uh, talk. So I will make it uh, short. Uh, what I want to uh, share with you is uh, something uh, very simple that uh, probably all uh, experience uh, Turner's nose. Um, there is a, a, a it's very important when you start turning uh, to uh, mount the the piece of wood that you're going to turn and the key to uh, mount it uh, properly is um, uh, there are few things that uh, you need to uh, follow when you mount uh, the wood and uh, <clears throat> So you can see the uh, illustrate, uh, illustration there that there are a, a way, a right way to mount it. So you have uh, the piece of wood uh, vertical to, to the, wood, to the uh, chuck, uh, uh, unless you're using a dovetail chuck that uh, should be uh, with the angle of the chuck and you should have a, a shoulder, a clear shoulder, <clears throat> that <clears throat> a, a, a clear shoulder that will uh, a, a mount the wood in a way that it won't be uh, crooked. So those shoulders will be um, a, a very good uh, way to uh, position the wood uh, properly. And of course, if if the shoulder is um, uh, in a, a angle, that's not uh, as good as well. So <clears throat> basically, uh, Sean is going to uh, uh, put this uh, in, uh, key uh, key uh, essential safety tips for uh, using uh, the chuck. Uh, and I just want to emphasize this illustration and I want you to uh, be safe. So, uh, safe and uh, enjoy turning. Go ahead. Thank you, Effie. <laughs> yeah, the safety is always something that you, uh, it doesn't, you don't want it to be an afterthought because that's never good. Um, so, given that, I'm going to let Jack take over the microphone, take over the main screen, and get right into his demonstration for this month. Everybody, this is Jack Karstens. Thank you. Jack, you're muted right now. Okay, is that unmuted yet? Now you're fine. Now I'm fine, thank you. Okay, back to the slideshow. Um, I've got a quick slideshow to kind of walk through the process and then I'll just get in and start turning something. Um, so the, the, these two bowls, these were the first ones that I did um turn them together it's um lace wood and palm um and i probably did this about three four years ago pretty early in my turn wood turning um and i always wanted to go back and turn more of them so um this cherry bowl i was down at the shop and uh, mike thomas saw me messing with it and he's like hey do you want to do a demo on this um, you know, he thought I had carved the grooves and whatnot. And I said, no, no, you don't have to do any carving on this. Um, here's an example of some um, bowls I did just to, to show different sorts of carving. The one set on the left has just some V points carved into it using a spindle gouge. Um, the uh, ones on the right, they just have some uh, concave portions to it. Um, 
again using a spindle gouge. Um, here I tried turning um, on the left. There's a cherry and maple bowl. They are um, actually convex shaped rather than square shaped. And then um, the one on the right is poplar and those are concave shapes. So they go in. So there's more of a point on those. This is um, a crab apple tree that, um, I, you know, I, I was like, well, this is pretty round here. Do I, can I skip uh, two axis turning uh, to get the shape right? And um, it turned out this way and I kind of liked it. So I thought I would show it just to spark an idea. You can use a, basically the same concept and, and modify it a little bit based on the kind of wood you want to try to, to use on this. This was uh, turned dry. I had a crack, so I used that crack um, that was in the log uh, to dictate where I was going to cut. You know, it happened to be going right through the pit, so that dictated where I parted the, the bowl and in, in the two halves. Um, this is overall the uh, steps that you go into for this. And, and I've got some pictures of that, so I'll walk you really through the pictures. Um, I hope that um, at least this, if not the whole PowerPoint, can get out on the, our website. So first you start out with two pieces of wood. Um, after the first one I did, I added a spacer because the, when you turn between centers, you end up getting marking the wood where the center point is. Um, so the spacer kind of helps eliminate that. Two ways to do that. One is uh, with glue. Um, and in this case, I'm using tri-bond and some brown paper. Uh, the other thing is double-sided tape. Then you got the two blocks, you glue them together. Um, this is an example of how I glued up something. And then uh, on the double-sided tape, I like to clamp it just to get the, the glue activated and hold that piece firmly if you don't. Uh, if you just casually press them together, it's not going to stick well enough when it gets on the lathe. Um, I also tried hot um, glue this afternoon, and that works very well. It's a little harder to separate the pieces with the hot glue, so it must hold it a lot better, uh, maybe a little bit too good. Um, I like to mark the centers along, at least along the um, spacer piece that I, I glue inside there. Um, I'll mark the, the ends, but I'm going to adjust those based on the, the actual shape that gets turned. Um, I find out at least half the time right now I end up adjusting it. So um, you get the, the it mounted on the lathe and you're basically just uh, roughing this out into a cylinder. Um, so it's it's pretty easy turning, you know, it's nothing that complex from this perspective. Uh, then you rotate it 90 degrees like this. And, um, and I'm basically using a roughing gouge for most of this. Um, and you turn it again. Um, now you have a little bit more air. It's not exactly a cylinder anymore, but you end up with this shape. And you can see the center point on the ends where um, once you turn it again, and I like to double check that, you know, that I have it centered. If not, I might adjust um, that center point. Um, but I get it set up in the lathe. And then using, I use a tool, so it, it helps me stay away from the tailstock. Um, I basically cut into the wood. I, I cut in a, a recess, or you can do a tenon. It's kind of your choice. Um, flatten out the bottom and decide whether you're going to do the, the recess or the tenon. Um, separate the pieces of wood. And to do that, I, I use a thin putty knife and a rubber mallet um, hammer. No big deal. And then here it is. It's mounted in the recess. Um, and then you turn it and you hollow it out for the bowl portion. So the bowl hollowed out portion is going to be round as compared to the rest of the bowl is going to be um, in a square shape. Um, so that's the basic process of getting there. Um, and I've got some other things I'll go back to and, and show you after the demo is done. Um, 
let me share now the cameras I've got and I'll get started with the uh, Jack, when do you, uh, when do you send the 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 outside? Uh, finishing and the outside. Um, it, it depends a little bit what you want to do on the outside, um, but for the most part, I would recommend that if if you're going to do a natural finish, you sand it while it's on the lathe. Um, in fact, Bill uh, Paolo. Dave, in, in, in the shop, we've got some of these too, but there's some sandpaper. It's, it's a long, you know, belt sander from a shop belt sander. And you can stick that under there once you, it's in a cylinder shape and it sands it real quick. Um, it takes you about 30 seconds as compared to, um, you know, trying to hand sand it once it's off the lathe. Uh, thank you, Epi. I know that was on the slide and I'm trying to get through the slides fast because I don't think the slides are nearly as exciting. But So let me um, kind of put these full screen. There we go. And okay, I'm going to try to get this in the middle so it's not in the way. There we go. So I've already glued and put some safety glasses on. Normally I wear the face shield because something like this, um, if you're not sure it can fly off the lathe and um, it may be entertaining for people, but it's not fun for the turner. Hey, Jack, I want to uh, remind everybody that uh, uh, you can see the screen that uh, Jack is sharing and you can slide the view that, to see uh, Jack's image and the screen that he's sharing. So you can uh, adjust the, the view so you can see the, the screen and, and Jack as well. Yeah, learning how to watch and zoom is another challenge. Um, I actually got some software at the Microsoft application store for free to, to show IP cameras. And I've got, got some USB attached cameras. I can show that at the end of the um, demo. So you make sure you don't want to really see my belly button, I don't think. There we go. Um, so basically, I mounted this block. This is um, attached with um, double-sided glue or um, tape. And the first tool I'm going to use is just going to be this roughing gouge. And it's um, definitely an inexpensive roughing gouge. It's, you know, the first set of tools I bought was, um, it was a Benjamin's Best. It got like eight tools for 80 bucks or something. And um, you probably use this roughing gouge so much this last couple months that um, it's paid for itself. But I don't, I don't typically use much of the roughing gouge. So I've got it mounted, I've got it tight, and I'm gonna start, I'm gonna crank the speed down to um, about 500 and make sure it turns right just to be safe. And then, you know, it just goes so much faster if you crank the speed up, so I'm gonna put it up to, about 1700 RPM. And if you watch all of the different cameras I've got going on, you'll see in, in my laptop camera, my body is moving. I'm actually not moving my arms at all. Um, I'm just moving my body back and forth to rough this out, trying to keep the tool on the bevel. And you can get very aggressive with this. Um, you know, I, I did notice that when you start turning with the open grain, you might get a little bit of tear out. Um, at least for this wood where 
Um, it's kind of set like more a traditional bow would. Uh, the tear out's not that bad. It, it sands out pretty quick and easy. So you can see here, I'm getting pretty close to that spacer piece. And I probably have a little bit more on this side than on here. Um, so I'll try to adjust that a little bit. Um, I'm hoping I've got my spacer pretty straight. So Jack, what's between those two pieces? So, um, well, this is a, actually another piece of, these, these are all poplar pieces, but this is, um, you know, like a, a four by uh, one, which is a three quarter inch thick piece of wood here. And it's got double sided tape holding it to these two. And these came off of a two by four of poplar. So I just cut two squares off the two by four to make this round. So, I mean, you can get any, any sort of um, exotic woods or you can buy, you know, cherry, um, walnut, that, that sort of thing um, in most stores um, or online. Um, and if you're cutting down trees, like I did I'm from, from my backyard when I had the hackberry cut down, I just ran it through the table saw and made a square. And um, like I said, I turned it this afternoon um, and it's spalted really nice. I haven't finished it, but I, I did turn it and um, got the grooves on it. So, um, and then you saw the, the one with the natural bark on it. You know, if you get it at the right time of year and the bark stays on, you don't even have to do this turning I'm doing because it's already done for you by nature. Well, that looks pretty good. It's, it's pretty much to that spacer. Needs just a little bit more here for me to reach it. But so let me try one or two, two more swipes and I'll be done with. Now, if, if I wanted a smooth side and I wanted to put finish on it, I would sand it here. Um, I can show you the sanding real quick just so you can see it. Now, this is 150 sandpaper and And it's not quite fully sanded, but um, it's pretty close. And that's, like I said, it, it goes very quick. So um, it's nice to do that. But um, since some of the balls I had and, and my inspiration for this originally was um, having some sort of features on it. And um, uh, I've, I've got another bowl that, that has it, but um, and it was also, the, the outsides of the bowl were, were painted. Um, and, and I've got an example of that, although it doesn't have the features on it that I'll, I'll bring up later. Um, I'm working on the last couple of days. Um, so, so you can do different kinds of finishes on that. Well, if you're gonna put features, grooves in that, you know, getting it real smooth is, is not necessarily as important. On this one, um, when I was playing with the roughing gouge, I figured out how I could make little coves on the side. So I'm gonna add features on the side before I turn it, rotate it, and um, uh, rough out the other side. And this is a trick I learned from uh, Rick Bywater, is just to, um, when he does his beads, he just kind of wiggles the tool a little bit.
So that gets you the little bit of features on it, kind of subtle, but I think if, if you were going to do something more with it, um, treatment wise, it would could be really attractive. And I've got these points, I'm going to turn my wood 90 degrees. I'm going to use those points. Now I got to take my tool rest back because it's the full width of the original wood now. And you know, one of the things I do is try to set that tool rest nice and straight um, so that it's parallel to the uh, gap in the ways of the, the lathe down here. Um, that way I can use my finger and press on that tool and then just run my finger along the tool rest. Um, and then I know I've got a pretty sharp cut, mostly. Poplar's a real soft wood. Um, it goes fast. Um, so if you're using um, a hardwood, it's definitely going to go slower. You got to make sure you, you may have to, to uh, sharpen your tool once or twice. But um, any other questions at this point as far as the demo? It's pretty. I thought it was pretty straightforward. After I did a couple of them, I was like, this is actually pretty easy. Again, I'm just roughing a cylinder, but now it's not quite square here, so I can start in the middle. Now, I do have the open side of the, the wood on this side, and you might see a little bit of pieces that are, you know, tearing out. And there's a little fuzz on there. Because um, in the middle there, you're turning very little wood and it's more air. The tear out's not so bad as compared if you try to, to, to rough out the open grain on your first pass, I think you end up getting more tear out. I just kind of stumbled into trying the open grain first versus trying it second. And I also found the tear out ends up being on the bottom of the bowl and you usually flatten the bottom to get your pen in a recess on it so it's not that big of a deal. And I can see as I'm roughing, I'm getting close to the corner of the first turning. So I'm gonna turn the lathe off and just take a look at it real quick. And I've got a little bit here, it's not quite done. This tear out, um, it leaves a little fuzz there, but with a real quick um, uh, sandpaper, the fuzz will be gone.
When do you know where to stop? Well, I'm looking basically at this little line here that's part of the spacer. And I at least need to get to that line. If I'm shy of that line, then I haven't turned part of that ball. Now this side of the ball along this line here has been turned completely to the top. So then I stop. So, you know, on this other side, it, it's actually all the way around. It's not going to matter because that middle piece is, you're not going to notice the sides were slightly different. It's probably not perfectly centered. It's close, but not perfect. Um, but that middle piece is going to disappear. The spacer is going to disappear. So. And then I'm going to go ahead and add the features in like I did on the other side. I haven't turned one yet where one side has features and one doesn't. Um, logically, it doesn't make sense to me to do that. but. There I've got four features on it. Um, I know I, I marked this one previously, but the markings are, I've turned them all away. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark where the center points ought to go on here, basically looking for the holes here have my pencil there and then mark it that way. And I'm flipping it just so I can mark the center point again on this side. So, you know, use that hole. There's the center point there. Um, I've had to turn the light down quite a bit in my shop, so I struggle a little bit with seeing, but I kind of like using the yaw and uh, creating that center point in the wood. Quick tap. That way the center point on your um, drive spur and your live center can find where you want them to sit in the wood. Of course, this is the bottom of the bowl, so you don't want to go in too heavily because you don't want to go through the bottom of the bowl. You want a little hole in the bottom of your bowl. Now, doing these features here, you know, on this one, there's, there's coves. Um, Like I said um, in the little PowerPoint, 
I've used um, spindle gouges to do coves, do beading, um, or you can use like a beading tool if you wanted to do beading on the outside of it. There's a lot of different tools you can use. Um, I just found as I was trying to different styles out with them that the roughing gouge um, was really easy to use to make these coves on there. So it was essentially what I wanted to do and it made the demo go fast. But if you, you've got the time, you want to take the time, um, I would suggest you go ahead and do that and use, use it, your tool of choice. I'm going to move out my tailstock just a little bit so I can better control my where my uh, tool rest goes because it's kind of on an angle. I don't really like that. I'd rather have it going straight in. So, so the next thing I need to do is kind of flatten the bottom, and it just takes a couple passes. Um, if I had my ball gouge out, I'd, I'd be using probably a ball gouge instead. I, I will use my ball gouge later, but right now I'm just using a spindle gouge to flatten that end out and just bring it right in here. It's only going to take a couple passes to get that. Um, trying not to, to bleed out too much on the camera because that was a problem I, I saw um, with the cameras, well, my shop is so bright normally, it was like, oh, I've got to lighten the camera look in, in here. So, but anyways, just to, to give a bottom or flatten out the bottom and give me room to put a re little recess on it. So that's about three eighths of an inch. It's not perfectly straight, but it's um, close enough, I think, for what we want to do. Um, I think I may do one more pass just to be safe. A little bit more. Now, you know, I've, I've made this tool um, really for doing dovetails on, on bowls when you've, um, there's different ways to turn a bowl. And, and sometimes when you've got both it between centers, that tailstock gets in the way. You know, like, you know, I can't get in there and get a tail, my dovetail in there. Well, this allows me to hold the, the tool at an angle away from the headstock, it would still be flush with the wood. And it's got a little dovetail on it, so I can, on the recess, get a little bit of a dovetail on it. Um, the other thing is I like to kind of mark, like if I'm going to do a recess, I don't want it to go you know, past that pencil mark. Just as kind of a visual safety thing, because as it's spinning, sometimes you can kind of see where the solid wood versus the air is, but you might miss it and it's not worth taking the chance on that. get a little bit more just to be safe.
Well, one of the tricky parts when you're putting a, a recess in there and you still have that center point is you have to be able to fit the jaws in between in that recess because you've got this thing in the middle here. So you can only close your jaws enough as far as that middle piece is going to let you go. Now, normally, um, I found flipping it to be much easier and going ahead and um, putting a recess on the other side. For um, the sake of the demo, I'm not going to um, worry about this piece. I'm going to make this be the, the bowl. I'll, I'll take to fruition, but you basically repeat the same steps on the other side. Jack, where is the sharp uh, edge of this tool? So um, this tool um, along this edge here, that's what I sharpen. I sharpen right along here. Yeah, like so, a scraper? Pardon? Like a scraper. Like a scraper, yeah. Now, you know, when I first formed it, it's, it's sharpened over there, but um, you don't do that much work on this side. All you're cutting is at that end right there. So it's, it's maybe like a badan um, but shaped to make a dovetail and shaped so the tool can be away from the headstock. So now that I'm done with the two accesses and I've got a recess, I'm going to take my drive spur out and I won't need the tail stock. I don't want to end up bumping an elbow or something. I can take that one out. And I think we're doing pretty good on time, so. Here's, here's another couple of commercials for you. Um, sometimes on the tear out, it's hanging. I'll use this uh, knife to cut the hanging pieces off so I don't get confused. This is a Richard Renzi special, awesome knife. And um, another plug for uh, a friend of ours who likes to make these thin parting tools. So um, that um, bark edged, bowl that I made, I use that to get started on the parting of it. Um, Mike, Mike can tell you more than I can about how we, how we make them, um, but they're made from uh, bandsaw blades. So normally I used um, Plywood is my spacer, and um, it's real easy to see where the plywood ends and the poplar starts. It's kind of hard when you use poplar against poplar. So I hope I'm not going to end up marring the good stuff. But we'll see. Jack, I don't know if you can hear me. This is Mike Thomas. I have a quick question about what method do you prefer to put those pieces together? Because I've seen you've used uh, a paper joint and then a double stick tape. And you're using double stick tape now tonight. Is that what you prefer? Um, I don't know that I have necessarily a preference. Um, they're different. If I have time, um, 
the gluing up with the brown paper is probably the easiest to separate. So that would be a, my preferred method. Um, the reason I use the double-sided tape, I think, was because if somebody wanted to see what the double-sided tape looked, I, I could actually do that and then go into turning the piece um, as part of the demo. Um, so I found out, I think, with um, when I was finishing, when I was using double-sided tape once and I was finishing and putting a, a shellac oil and alcohol uh, high-speed finish on it, um, the actual double-sided tape was actually separating. It was losing its grip because of the solution I was putting on the, the bowls because I finished it before I separated it and I finished it on the lathe. And, um, and so because of that, well, the glue wouldn't do that. You know, wood glue is impervious to that sort of uh, effect. Double-sided tape is stronger than my uh, putty knife. Which is half as much double-sided tape. That's I think so. I think so. I think I got carried away with this. I haven't had this much trouble in quite a while. So there it is apart. And um, a little bit of tape still on that side, but you know, that's going to be the, the bowl side right there. This is, still has a spacer on it. That other putty knife, um, I've, I've gone through a whole lot of bowls with it, you know, doing this sort of thing with it. Um, but I think today when I was using the hot glue, I used too much hot glue and it, it was hard. I think it started getting stressed. So to finish up the bowl, to hollow it out, um, this is a, a Pin jaws, it's, uh, it goes to about one inch on the uh, tenant side and on the recess side, it'll go to about an inch and a half. So it's smaller than the typical jaws that you get with something. And when I um, hollow out the wood, I like to try and follow the same kind of curve that you got there um, in the middle of the wood. Again, I think it's kind of um, easy to, to take this and draw your line with a pencil. Try not to break the, uh, the lead. And with that, you kind of get a feel for, OK, that's about where I want to be with the hollowing out portion of it. And I'm going to take the uh, tailstock off the lathe so I have enough room.
So I got down to the line pretty quick. Again, this is poplar, but I can just feel with my, my hands that the bottom is really thick. So I want to go deeper, take very little off the side, but go quite a bit deeper on this. So that's just, you know, at this point, it's like what works best for you for hollowing out a bowl um, and making sure you got the right dimensions on it. There you go. And if I was um, wanting to finish that inside of that, I could do it now, um, sand it and finish it. Or you, you know, you actually could wait because with the recess you can get it mounted again. If you had a tenon, you get rid of the tenon, that's it. You're done with it. So um, I get to skip this for the demo. I'll come back and do it later. Um, finish on the inside of that. And um, I've got something that's a crackle um, paint sort of thing. I want him to try that on, on this with the features on it because I think that might look kind of cool. So um, now there's a lot of different ways I think that you can get rid of that back piece at the bottom of the bowl and put your little goo gogs on it and whatnot. Um, I just found on, on these square bowls, you only have to use about half of the, well, exactly half of, on the coal jaws. So it's pretty easy. And all the bowls I was making were all about the same size. So um, I didn't have to worry about changing anything. And this is pretty easy, straightforward, just clean off that little nub on the bottom. Um, you know, it's the same kind of thing. You can use any tool you want on this thing. I've got the, the bowl gouge here, but I've used my spindle gouge for this. Um, Now, technically, I think the coal jaws, you're not supposed to go faster than about um, 900 or 1,000 RPM. So I should have turned that down. But um, I've never had problems going faster, but um, you don't need to either. So but that's, oh, got to put some goo gags at the bottom of it. Otherwise, I don't pass the Anthony, the ACME test. And I'm just going to use the all on this. This is not even a turning tool, but so that's the ball. Let me move this over here, right there.
Um, so sanding on the top side to get rid of some of that um, double-sided tape, I think, would, is in, in due order as well. So um, sometimes I'll use uh, the um, spindle gouge or the bowl gouge to chew up that top side. Um, but that looked pretty good the way it was. So. Um, I do have um, a couple of things to show. I assume we have a little bit more time. Um, something like that. I think you guys saw that was in the PowerPoint. <laughs> I really like the way this one turned out. Um, and I, I think the PowerPoint just doesn't do it justice. I think putting your hands on it is a much cooler thing. So this I actually, this is the uh, Perlex paint with a, um, um, glossy finish that it comes to and it's three different colors, two blues and a, a whitish color. So it's, it's a textured medium. This is a um, mixed medium. Jack, because, Jack, because of the latency, can you uh, uh, put it steady and for a little uh, bit longer? Okay. Yeah. So um, this is this is a mixed media paint that my son brought um, in from Colorado. He's been playing with it and said, "Oh, you should try some of this." And you put um, three or four different colors on there, and they had they they don't mix. The colors don't mix. They 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 separate and they kind of swirl into each other. And the finish is a very much a kind of an enamel, shinier finish. Um, where is this textured medium um, is a, even though this is a gloss finish and it's a metallic, it's a pretty cool metallic like color. Um, at least the way I apply it with a brush um, it doesn't have a real smooth. It's a it's a textured finish on it. So. Jack, how many sides you can have to a square a square? Bowl? Perfect perfect lead in. The square bowls I showed you. Effie had challenged me, and um, I, I, I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint and show you this. Um, this is one half of the, of the piece, um, but basically done the same way. Uh, slight modification but um, it's actually six-sided. So instead of having a 90 degree separation between the, the between center points, uh, I first turned around cylinder and fixed six points equal distance. I turned, um, after I turned it round, I used the uh, lathe and the um, indexer on the lathe to get me six positions equally spaced, marked them, and then spun those positions like this, like this, you know, point to point, basically. Um, it was interesting. So um, I think, Effie, I think you could go to any number you want to. At some point for this size, you know, I think if you got to 16 pieces, it would start looking round, but again, different instead of it being round like we're used to because it got turned around this way, it would look round with all these, you know, grooves coming up from there looking like it had been carved or something. So and if you get a bigger piece, you could probably do more um, indexes on, on it. So um, I just, um, I'm going to 
pull up um, the PowerPoint I was showing earlier, and I've got a section on the six-sided bowls. I'll show you that. And then um, I just want to show you what I had to go through to get my shop ready. Um, let's see, share that. So here's the six-sided bowl. And so you see on the top, it's really those corners to corner. Of course, you don't see the corners right away. It's, it's a circle when you start and you're turning off parts of that circle. But you, if you can visualize that thing turning on the lathe with the points that way, and you're just going straight across it with the, your roughing gouge, just like I was doing with a square, except now I've got six points. Um, I turn it three times, so it's on three axes instead of uh, two axes to get that um, worked out. So uh, that, that was very interesting. I was glad Effie gave me the inspiration to do that. This is my shop. Um, I had to build this whole platform, my laptop, um, slides into there. It mounts, you can see on the upper right. That's something I got at the uh, AAW Symposium in Kansas City. Um, it's hardware they used to use to mount their monitors, um, but now they've, they've gone to some a different mechanism, so they didn't need the hardware. They were gonna throw it out, and I just threw them in a box and I brought them home. Um, down here is the mounting of one camera. It's on a tripod. This is, um, a deck rail that I had extras. It's a piece of aluminum. And then I just uh, kind of made a piece here to mount the USB camera to. It plugs into my laptop sitting on that shelf. And then the other one, the overhead one, is on this. There's a hinge here and a hinge back there. So I can adjust it. And I've got this cord right here, which is adjustable. It's, um, it's, it's what I put the mic on at the shop. Um, so it's, it's bendable, it's a bendable metal thing. Um, so I can fine tune the adjustment on that camera and it, and it stays pretty solidly once it's there. So I didn't have any of this stuff in my shop. I didn't have a place to put it. I had to drill holes in the foundation wall in order to mount the, the thing up on top. And when I first started, I thought I could use um, the cameras on some Wi-Fi devices, but it kind of clogged up Zoom um, when I did a test with Effie and Rick. And so I went to the USB cameras as an alternative. Um, here's a little bit more, the lighting, adjusting the lighting. Um, I had, uh, I put paper, taped paper to the lighting, the, the overhead lighting up here. Um, I flipped it upside down so it points towards the ceiling. It was still bright. There's, you know, um, duct, duck work up there, so I guess it reflected off of that. But just so you'd get the decent pictures um, and, and the bowl didn't look white and washed out, um, I had to cover my shop lamps. And then I built this little shelf here to put my roller ball on, um, although I haven't really used it that much today. So um, those are the things I had to do in my shop to get ready for this. So it's not something you can just say, oh, I'll do a, a a demo next, you know, in two days, it's like, no, I need time to prepare for that. Jack, your camera, uh, your, the two camera vision, uh, views that you had were very, very good for good. that demo. It went really, really nice. Good. Yeah. Yeah, the only thing that was embarrassing was, uh, was bending my putty knife. I hadn't done that before. So. And I must have turned, you know, 20 of these things and it's like, why it went out now, I don't know. But any questions? Yeah, I have a question. What exactly is the difference between a, a goo -ga and a doodaddy? Uh, you know, as far as I know, they're the same thing. It depends if your name ends in Anthony Harris or it ends in somebody else's. Yeah. Well, you figure it's a, a dialect? Uh, first letter's different. 
Yeah, Jack, I've got a question. How big was the block to start with? Um, well, the one that I, I turned tonight was um, came off a two by four. So, you know, that's what um, one and three quarters by three and three quarters or something like that, or three, three and, and a half, half, I believe. Yeah, it, it depends on um, how much finishing work had to be done to the two by four. You know, because you're going to turn those sides, it doesn't have to be a perfect square. Um, but it does help a little bit for the gluing up portion of it. Does does the depth uh, have a relationship to the width of the o end product? So, you know, I've done different size pieces. Um, like, you know, the cherry piece, um, I, I didn't have, the, the piece I used wasn't as thick. Um, but, you know, thinking about it, um, Geometrically, you cannot have the bowl um, thinner or two times the, the, the height of the bowl is, is the thinnest the width of the bowl can be. So if your width is shorter than two times, so if your diameter of the bowl is less than twice the radius being, you know, from the, the center point down to the bottom, um, then what you end up doing is turning more of the bottom away so you've actually turned the sides. So there's no reason to make it um, the bowl deeper because you're not going to be able to turn the sides with this technique. You know, you'd have after, to do after you, adjustment. At the point you've glued it up, do you need the, the, the glue up piece to be square? Uh, once everything's glued together, does it need to be a perfect square to come out right? Um, it, it doesn't really need to be because you're going to be turning that side. Um, the, you know, it was the kind of thing I never attempted to get it perfectly squared. I just I threw it on the table saw, cut it off, and it was close to square, and that was good enough. And and you'll see it sometimes when you turn is that that spacer piece. Um, uh, um, you can tell when, when it, it's it's the line in all but one of them. It's like, oh, this piece is not perfectly squared, and that's why I, I got to turn it a little further to, to to finish turning that one corner of the bowl. Um, I I put the spacer in there just because of the point of the the, the in the, the spur, the drive spur, and the tail life center. Um, if you didn't have that, or if, if you're going to clean off the front, the top side of the bowl enough to get rid of that point, um, you may not have to do that. I mostly use, um, depends kind of what, what I'm doing, but, um, well, I guess I don't have my camera on now. So, so this kind of a spur that's meant more for like, um, flattened wood, you know, it's got lots of little tiny grooves or catches in it, teeth in it. Um, I like using that when I've got something that's sawn and, and relatively um, flush. Um, this, you know, in these, what I like about them is, is they're all spring loaded. Um, I prefer that. It doesn't leave as big of a divot. This one that I've got is not spring loaded. So, um, and, you know, it's just a cup. If it was spring loaded, the cup wouldn't bother me. Now, what I find with, with these is that I'll tend to leave a couple little marks on the side of the bowl up near the rim that either have to get sanded out or if the spacer is wide enough, um, then all of those little marks stay on the spacer and not on the bowl. So the bigger the bowl you turn, the, you know, the relatively smaller the spacer would be. Um, I think the, um, uh, live center I've got is, is um, five eighths of an inch at the cup, and so it would that's where it would stop leaving. So if I had a spacer that's five eighths, I got an eight inch ball I'm making. Well, that's five eighths off of four inches is not that bad. Anybody else got a question for Jack?
You'll have to unmute yourself if you want to say something. Doesn't look like it, Jack. I think okay. you did an excellent, excellent job of uh, just walking through that and the steps you, you had and, and the PowerPoint um, really kind of brought it to light. That was a great presentation. We thank yeah. you very much for it. Well, thank you. My challenge is just to turn a multi axis bowl. Um, I thought it was easy enough because it's it's mostly just roughing something around and then you just hollow out the ball part. So as many axes, accesses as you want, go for it. All right. Well, uh, everybody that appreciated Jack's uh, demo there, give him a thumbs up in your window screen. I thought it was a great, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't, thumbs up. Good job. Good job. Yeah, good, good job. job. Good job, Jack. Jack. Thank you very much. Is this almost as good as being at the shop and seeing a demo? No. Uh, the no. camera work. The camera work was even better. <laughs> yeah, the, that's right. The views were great. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Just that a good organization on your your demo was was great. I really appreciate it. You can tell that he took a lot of time and effort to put put into. Uh, the lighting and the camera views and everything else because it was excellent. And now that you've retrofitted your shop, um, we'll we'll be signing you up for demos uh, further down the, the year. <laughs> there is a path from my back door to the basement door to down here. You'll be social distanced the whole time. You can come here and demo here next month. No big deal. Oh, Jack, thank you very much. I'm going to call that and cut you, cut you off as far as uh, uh, putting all the pressure on you here. I really appreciate your time. Great, great presentation. I thought it went, went tremendously. So um, yeah. this is your chance, y'all. Hey, Jim Reynolds, I see you out there. I haven't seen you for a while. It's good to see you. Good to see you guys. <laughs> Hey, uh, while you're talking to me, I have a question for Forrest. Forrest, what part of Texas are you from? Fort Worth. Fort Worth? That's you down did. in uh, Jimmy Johnny Tolley area. Say again? Jimmy and Johnny Tolley. I don't know the name. Okay. Don't know them. All right. Are they Turners? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> are they a member of the North North Texas Wood Turners? Uh, group, or do you I'm pretty know? sure Johnny is. I'm not real sure about Jimmy. Where do they live? They have a lot to do with the SWAT uh, symposium setup. Yeah. Huh. No, I don't don't know those names. All right, thank you. There, there's a very active uh, Dallas club, and then there's a very active Denton uh, club that's up north Fort Worth in Dallas. Okay. I, I do know in San Antonio, there's several, several very active clubs in, in uh, Texas. I think without checking uh, that they're outside of San Antonio, but I'd have to double check that. Well, they're probably members of that club down there, yeah. Okay. At any rate, uh, we're sure glad you joined us tonight. Well, I've enjoyed it very much. You bet. And I've, uh, Ann brags on you folks a lot, you know, and uh, I said she's learned so much, particularly when she has a chance to to go down to your shop on a Saturday and, uh, and somebody hanging around looking over her shoulder and saying, here's a better way to do it and so forth. So, uh, she's, uh, I've been real, I, I take credit for introducing her to the, uh, to the sport, but, uh, but now there's not much else I can teach that woman. She's, uh, <laughs> she's, 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 she's solo. Of course, you got to take a lot of credit for that because, she won our most improved Turner Award for last year for 2018. Oh, I, would, I, I knew about that immediately after it happened. <laughs> she's, she's got a whole menagerie of animals at home now that she's turned out of wood. Oh, those little aren't they little cuties? <laughs> they are. And, they are fun. Uh, it's and it's fun for her to tell about uh, uh, going to one of these shows that you guys do a a, 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 a craft show or something and. And she just gets out there and meets the public and, you know, just hobnobs around and hands out business cards and invites them to the club and everything. She's, she's never met a stranger, I don't guess. <laughs> but she does have to learn how to be a little bit friendlier. Well, I, I've done all I can do. The rest of it's up to you guys, I guess. Uh, but, all right. I'm, I'm going to... 
get into a few more notes here that I've got written down. So if anybody needs a uh, restroom break or needs to go get another cup, cup of coffee or, or a drink, this would be a good time to do it. Um, not too many here. I, I did want to let you know that John Gathright, who was uh, on our on our board for I think over a year or about a year anyway, um, he's resigned from the board, and Mark Inman has agreed to step in in his place. So I want to thank John. I know he's not on here, but if you guys see John at, at any of the turning events, he's still he's still retaining his membership. He's just getting off of the board and and. He's no longer going to be an opener closer, um, but thank him for his uh, time on the board because he was very helpful and had had some good ideas and, and oh. always, always showed up and was willing to, to give us give us his time on that. Um, Mark, we're excited to have you in. Uh, you've been to several of our board meetings and you're always willing to jump in and and uh, take care of things, and I really appreciate that. So welcome and and. I uh, appreciate that you, you took that spot. Um, Mark Inman was also John's backup on the nights that he was uh, the opener. And Mark is, is agreed to take over the primary opener yeah. spot on those nights. But there is some time uh, coming up this year that we might need to help Mark out because he's got a back surgery. Is that right, Mark? Uh, yes, actually next Wednesday. That's next Wednesday, so, so he might be healed by the time we get out. there. <laughs> so right, we'll we'll take care of that, Mark, and we appreciate you stepping up for us. Um, the other things that I got here is Ann, Ann was trying to follow up on the Strawberry Swing event. They had talked about possibly trying to pull off a quick um, video type Chris, Chris, yes. Chris, can you hear me? Yes, I can. There are some noise, so I'm going to unmute everybody. And if you want to talk, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Okay. So I'm, I guess I'm the one talking, right? Yes. All right. Um, so the strawberry swing event that we were trying to get into this year, it was kind of a craft sale, but it was a, a fairly well attended craft sale. Um, with the with the pandemic stuff going on, I, I think they were trying to convert it to an online type activity and was doing her best to try to keep up with um, what they were planning. It was all going to be happening pretty quick. So I think we've decided to opt out of the strawberry swing event this year. But um, do keep your eyes open towards August of next year. There is another event, another strawberry swing. We're hoping that the pandemic issues won't be there at that point. And so we'll try to get ourselves as a club back into that event next year. Hey, Chris. Um, Chris? Yeah. Yes. Okay. The, um, the show is going to go on this year, but it's going to be a virtual show. So... Um, it wasn't going to work for us since we don't have a website where we sell our products. Cause what they would do, I think is they would talk to people and then they would refer them to the website, the individual websites. So right. maybe, um, you know, if they do that again, we might be more prepared. Um, the, the next show coming up though is the summer show. So it's in August. So that's what, how many months away? Three months away. Three so, months away. Okay. Um, we have been invited to participate in that. Um, and hopefully then that will be a regular type craft show like we have attended in the past. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Ann, for straightening me out there. Um, uh -huh. and, and just, and Ann will keep us uh, abreast of what's going on and then we'll pass it on to the club as, as we know a little bit more there. Um, just want to keep this in your in your heads that the Irish Festival is still planned uh, for Labor Day weekend. We haven't heard anything different, and um, to the best of my knowledge, we will attempt to be there with a, a booth like we have in the, the years past. Um, 
I had a note here that the Woodworkers Guild will be changing the door locks. I don't know. I, I haven't been able to confirm that. We were having some confusion, confusion earlier where, where that statement came in. I had it in my notes from our meeting. So until we hear anything differently, um, just disregard that. But if they do change the locks, we'll find a way to get our openers a uh, new set of keys uh, or a, a new key to get in the front door. Um, I wanted to thank Dave Stalling. Dave, I saw you earlier. I don't know if you're on my window right now, but uh, Dave provided the um, silent auction piece for last month. It was very well received and it was a beautiful piece. And Dave, I, I wanted to thank you for your uh, participation in that. Um, do it. This month, uh, the uh, silent art auction is actually one of Jack's uh, bowls that he just demonstrated. Um, he's got some uh, very, very nice work and a little bit larger piece, I think, that, that he's got out there for the auction. I want to encourage everybody to take a look at the piece on the website. You have opportunities to then bid on that piece. Um, you're supporting your club. You're supporting Jack and, and, and the time that he put into that. So everybody, uh, please consider bidding on that. Um, Kevin, can you tell me how long the bidding is going to be open for? This week, that's the 15th. The 15th. So we'll Friday. have bidding, bidding until, the bidding until this Friday. So. I, I thought that's what I had in my notes, but I didn't know if, if that was exactly right. So it will stay open for bidding until this Friday. Jump on the website and you can uh, uh, put a bid up um, for Jack's, Jack's Chris, piece. The, the, the ball in the auction is a three-pointed ball turned from a cube. It's, oh. It's not the same thing I just turned tonight. It's not the demo. Okay. I'm whoa, wow. Something I demonstrated a couple of years ago. Yeah, you did demonstrate it though. Uh, last year? Yeah, yes. That's that's the image I saw in your PowerPoint that I couldn't figure out why that why it was in there, Jack, so I apologize. Um, this is a turn from a cube three-sided bowl. Jack did a demonstration on it uh, last year. Um, very, very cool and he took it about as far as you could take it as far as investigating all the different opportunities that you can do with that so um please take a look at the piece and consider a bid thank you um i think that's about it for my president notes so we've gotten through that portion we're going to attempt here to do the challenge if if anybody has a piece from Mike Thomas's demonstration on the uh, everyday carry, the EDC box is what he called it, then um, we'll give you an opportunity to jump in here and show it and talk about it. The, I think, easiest way, if, if you can go down to the bottom of your, your screens where you list the participants, and click on participants it'll bring up a list and at the bottom of that list now this may not be the same on a phone as it is on the pcs but at the bottom of that list there's a spot where you can raise it it says invite mute me or raise hand so anybody that uh, would would have something to show for the challenge and let me tell you that uh, the winner of this month's challenge will get two craft supply gift certificates as, as uh, the prize for this, this month. But if you want to raise your hand over there, and if that doesn't work and we don't have anybody raising their hand, I see four hands raised, five hands raised. If you don't know how to, if you don't have, uh, can't find the place to raise your hand at the end of this when when I get through the people that have raised their hand I'll ask everybody if they have if there's anybody else and you'll have an opportunity to just unmute yourself and say yes I've got something and we'll go to you but I'm going to start with Mark Inman because he's the first one on my list with the raised hand 
So Mark, do you want to go and uh, show us what you got? Uh, sure. See how I can share. Uh, Effie, can you highlight him? Uh, uh, if in the window you have an option to do a pin video, and that's uh, how you can increase the enlarge the screen. All right, and then, uh, what is it, Effie? Uh, there are three dots in the corner, and there is an option to do a pin. It's called pin video. That's in the corner of your image in the Teams meeting, Mark. Okay, uh, okay, got the it. Three dots. All right. Um, or we can we just do as, if you want to share it's your just a, um, It's just a file, it's not a video. Okay, you can share your screen. Or, uh, Everybody can use the speaker, speaker view, and uh, then we'll see. We'll all see you. All right. Uh... Yeah. So I can see you now because I set it to speaker view, so we can see you now. Okay. So you can see my screen. See you. Oh. You to, to, to share your screen, there was an item on the bottom in the middle of the. Of got, the it, got it. Got it. Got it. And then, then you select the screen you want to share and... Okay. Yep, there you go. So that's it. I've uh, turned this several weeks ago or probably a long... It was right after the last meeting. So uh, I don't have it anymore. I uh, give it away to a uh, stoner. So that's a... <laughs> it looks like oak. But yeah, that was, uh, that was it. That's nice, Mark. Mark, that looks like oak. Uh, actually, I think it is. I really don't know, but I think it is. It come out of a a, a house, uh, my wife's aunt's house. Uh, it was a planter stand. Uh, that I so it was very old. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Good job of uh, getting it up there. Um, Linda, looks like you're next on my list. You want to jump in there and show us what you've got? Made a box about that big. Not sure what it's out of, but it holds um, six dollars worth of quarters. If you can see all those, so if I never need quarters, here I've got them. One thing that I did do, I took, you know, when you have the one more cut and you shouldn't take one more cut. Well, I did. So I had to, it was kind of loose. So I took a little bit of golden thread. I don't know if you can see that there and put a layer of glue on it. And so now it just works. I'm going to get it back in there. Ah, works great. I can even turn it upside down with all my quarters and it doesn't fall. So I'm <laughs> I can hear that friction pop when you pull the lid yeah. off. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Way to go, Linda. Good job. And I turned one out of a, just a hunk of walnut that I had around. And it looks pretty good. And then I just started experimenting with some other ones after that. And they didn't go quite so well. <laughs> and even a, a fairly big one of walnut and, and maple glued together kind of fun but it's hard to get you know when your your lines are vertical like that it's hard to get them to line up so <laughs> but i don't know it was fun anyway good job good job okay i'm gonna go on to rick rick bywater you're next up please seems like for the last month i've been making big nuts and bolts uh, you're on to uh, what, show and tell. And, and uh, so basically what I've done is I've made containers out of them. I hope that qualifies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it does. That's what I call thinking out of the screw. <laughs> Will it fit in your pocket? 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. And then, and then this one is a segmented head, but basically it's the same, the same thing. It unscrews the container all the way down. How did you thread it? Oh. Um, this is a 10 thread per inch thread chased. They're hand chased. And then the, these oh. are the, for, the, for the big bolt part, that's four and a half threads. And chased. And what uh, what is the nut made of? Uh, the nut I ended up buying. Uh, this is a Caribbean rosewood. I ended up buying that at uh, Metro Hardwoods, and it. I'll tell you what. It cuts a thread just beautifully. I don't know if you can see see it very well there, but uh, yeah, it, it 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 was a wonderful wonderful uh, project. So very, very nice. nice, very, very well, well done. Okay, good job, Rick. Um, Phil Royer, you're my next one. Yeah, I've, um, here's a to show a box of everyday carry boxes and uh. Turn them out of wal walnut and maple and some cherry and some uh, Swiss pear wood. One of the things I did do was I made a, a, a multiple beading tool. I don't know whether that, that is in focus enough to uh, uh, so you can see what I did. I took an old Sorby uh, a half inch uh, by a quarter of an inch tool ground it square and then ground the little beads into it so I can do uh, multiple beads at once. And, uh, Bill, could you hold that box up again? Um, I need to take a picture for the newsletter. Yeah. That's very cool, Phil. Looks like you went uh, whole hog too, <laughs> a box full of them. <laughs> well, there, there there has been this thing going on called the pandemic, and it uh, it, 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 helps my, it it helps my mood to get out in the shop and make chips. That's awesome. So it looks like you've been making some. I, I yeah, yeah. appreciate it. Do those spin as well as your tops? Uh, oh yes, yes they do. Thanks, Phil. I'm going to go on now to Joe Vega. Hi, I'm here in Zoom. Oh, there you go. Yeah. You need well, uh, before I got going really good on these, I screwed up a bunch of them, so I don't know if that's like a bolt. But I did get a few of them made, and they're just small and normal. I wanted to show one thing that I did do to one where the cap was way too loose, and I know this takes away a little bit of the usefulness of the item, but I put, I don't know if you can see that, but I put a dowel up in the top hole that was the same size as the bottom hole, and that way now it sticks together and it doesn't come apart. So it makes it a little bit smaller, but it does, if, if, you, if you top and bottom don't go together right, if they're too loose, that made a tight fit. So it makes it at least half of it works. Like you reestablish the friction fit. Yeah. The one, yeah, that was a good idea. Anyway, good it, thinking. It worked. All right. Thank you, Joe. Good job. Um, Sue, Sue Bergstrand, where are you? I can't see your picture. I got to go to the next screen, but you're out there with an example. Go ahead. Yeah, I made a. I don't know whether I'm showing up or not. I'm yeah, you are. Oh. Um, I made a. Uh, small box and I hollowed the top so I could put an enamel in it there oh yeah so the box. Sue and her enamel work good job Sue <laughs> you know, without a big lathe at home I'm getting more enameling time in than turning time oh yeah that's, that's probably true <laughs> all right thank you for sharing 
Um, I'm going to go on next to Anthony. Anthony, do you got your screen on? Let's see. You missed Joe. Oh, yeah. there you go. Okay, I see you, Anthony. Anthony, Anthony you going to show us your box? You got to unmute yourself, Anthony. Already showed it. How's that? I there made a go. box out of uh, briar, and it's uh, I stained it with uh, two different colors. First, I uh, essentially stained it black with uh, uh, printer's ink, and then I sanded it off so that just the hard grain that had absorbed the uh, black stain stayed, and then I put a lighter color over it. And I guess I put uh, I made two lids. The other one is uh, meerschaum, and I've uh, I've chased a thread in meerschaum before, but I don't do it too often. It's a really soft material, um, so it was kind of fun. <laughs> Why do you use meerschaum? Say it again. Why do you use meerschaum? Is that does does that not burn or is it? Yeah, soft, it's. It's a Turkish clay that uh, absorbs moisture and is supposed to smoke cool. Oh, okay. So I, I smoke my box. It's a smoking <laughs> box. Not a pipe. <laughs> it's not a pipe. It's well, a I mean, it's a box. box. It? The lid screws <laughs> on. <and laughs> got a hole works. in the middle. It's, I think it fits our criteria. We're pretty, we're pretty loose. <laughs> Thanks, Anthony. Thanks right. for sharing. <laughs> um, Mark Turner, I think if you start talking, you'll come in. Got it? Oh, uh, yeah, I see you. Okay. It's a, it's a linen box, but it was sort of a big piece of birch, <laughs> so I turned it into an urn, um, but it's a friction fit up here and did, did a reverse of of what Anthony had shown me to do a long time ago, rather than have the lip up here, I put it on the on the lid, which you can see like that, and then just matched up all the the grain and finished it with. Um, it's actually spalted, you know, quite a bit in here, all the black that you see, and finished it with the um, a finish similar to what Jack was talking about. I mixed uh, linseed oil, shellac, and alcohol, and then let that dry, but did that on the lathe and then polished it with the with the beel polisher. And what kind of wood was it? Birch. Birch. Yeah, it's okay. just a branch of birch that uh, broke off in one of the storms and let it was pretty dry when I uh, when I turned it and probably three four years old piece of uh, piece of birch. Okay, looks great. Good Thank job. Uh, does it fit in your pocket? Um. <laughs> If I'm wearing my overalls, sure it does. There you go. <laughs> get, get bigger pockets. All right. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Mark. Okay, Anne. Anne, Melina. Okay. I just have a little, little simple box and burn some lines in it. So that was about it. It looks like you followed instructions very well because that looks really close to what Mike turned that day. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, now, did you did you drill the inside or did you turn the inside? I drilled, you drilled it. it? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, yes. good job, Ann. Thanks. All right, uh, Burke Gallagher. Is Burke there? Okay, nope. Burke, let's see. There you are. Burke, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Okay. There you go. Okay. There we unmuted. All righty. Yes. Uh, just got a simple little cherry box. Nothing nothing terribly special, but it looks pretty nice. So. Looks good. Yeah. Boxes are fun to turn. So. Yes, they now, are. Did you, hollow, did you hollow the inside with a tool or did you drill it? Uh, hollowed it. You hollowed it. Okay. Okay. 
it seems like uh, the bigger the box, the more that that's going to be the solution for the inside. You're going to going to hollow it if it's bigger, but those smaller ones, it's almost impossible to find a tool that'll get that small. So drilling is the way to go. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, Bert. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask Effie to unmute everybody wait, and wait, give. Wait, 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 you, you missed Tony Giordano. We're, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't go down my list far enough. No. Okay, Tony. I I did miss you, but I don't see your hand raised. So it's just this is this is Tony. Go ahead and show what you've got. Tony, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, Tony's on. I, he doesn't have video. Just tell us about it, Tony. <laughs> He's got video. Hey, got oh, okay. <laughs> you can hear me? Okay. Here's the first one. Yes. I made it from a broom handle. <laughs> Section Chuck there. Uh, decided I needed to burn a hole here for where they together. Decided I needed more than one. So I put the other two, and then I could get it apart until it cooled. <laughs> yeah. So this is the second one I made. The uh, friction's not quite open, but I rolled the two edges, and I think it looks better. Oh, that looks cool. So would you say that's a sweeping change from the, uh, the way the other boxes were made? <laughs> <laughs> That's a change. <laughs> All right, good job, Tony. Okay, I guess at this point, anybody uh, that has something for the challenge that we missed that maybe couldn't raise, figure out how to raise the hand or not, just unmute yourself and say something right now. Is that how you raise your hand? Um, no. Okay. I think that gets us through our challenge. Well, um, one more. Oh. Okay. I turned four more of them after my demo last month, and all the kids came over for uh, Mother's Day yesterday, and they find their way into my shop, and stuff disappears. <laughs> So this afternoon I was looking for those four boxes and I couldn't find them. And so I talked to Ellen and she said, oh yeah, she and Chris took a couple of them. And so, anyway, <laughs> got, let me see if you've seen these. <laughs> I don't know if you can see these. Oh yeah. But uh, one looks like a cigar. Yeah, that's my Cohiba. And uh, there you go. This, I think this is the one I turned for the you no know, demo. It looks like a yeah. baseball bat. And then this is one that was really kind of neat that was fun to do that is um, square so it doesn't roll off the table or anything. But it uh, is birch. And just a, just a variation on a different shape there, but I'm gonna have to learn how to hold this stuff up here so you can see it. But anyway, um, watch it when your kids come over to your shop and everything because they see stuff they like, and I tell them, you know, a lot of you can just have it, and that's how I get rid of a lot of my stuff. But I got rid of more than I wanted to. I said, you could have them probably after the demo. I would have told them that, but anyway, they're over at my daughter's house, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate okay. everybody participating and uh, trying to make these and I enjoy that because that's how I learn <laughs> it was a fun little project and I think uh, everybody enjoyed enjoyed doing doing that so all right I think that gets us through our challenge um, Kevin can you remind me how we are determining our winner this week this month well actually I have determined a winner already what all right did was we numbered all the entrants, there were 13, and we drew a random number uh, 
Google uh, drew a random number for us, and the number turned out to be Mark Turner. Mark Turner was the winner of the challenge this month. And what? Hi, right, Mark. Yeah, and uh, Mark, thank you thank very you. much, Mr. <laughs> Lucky you. Winner. I'm going to send you two numbers uh, for two craft supply uh, coupons, and you'll get them in the mail. You don't need the actual coupons, just the numbers. So you'll be able to order uh, well, $20 worth of craft supply stuff uh, due to your win today. Thank you. That, as Mike said, that when it's here, it will be, um, you know, when the kids come over, when you know, they release me from quarantine, it will disappear rather quickly, so. <laughs> Always does. All right, super job. Uh, and then thanks for all the participation, guys. I think that was great. Um, okay, last thing I'm going to uh, do tonight for this meeting will be the challenge, or excuse me, uh, the show and tell. And we're gonna use the same format um, if, if you have a show and tell item you'd like to present here, um, raise your hand, Tony. <laughs> Are you raising your hand, Tony? Yes. <laughs> All right, I'm going to start with you this time. <laughs> okay. For Sean and Jerry, oh. need like eight tops with Corey on. Oh, wow. Thank you, All Tony, because right. those look great. I'm sure I'm sure tops are in a short supply since we aren't in the shop so this is great you're you're helping helping keep the supply going while we're quarantined Tony That's great. Okay. thank you very much all right anybody else you just go out and raise your hand um, if you raised your hand for the challenge can you go out and unraise your hand so I know that we've got different people here Or just leave it raised if you have a show and tell item. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, I'm going to start then, Mike. You're the first one on my list here, Mike Thomas. If you want to show us your show and tell this week, let me go. Month. Let me go after because I've got to try to move my camera laptop over to my lathe. So okay, okay. Somebody else, I'll come back. All right, I'll come back to me. David. David Stalling, you are next on my list. Come on okay, down. Share the screen here. All right. And I got to figure out what it is I got to do to do this. Uh, and you went down to the bottom, you picked share screen, and yeah. then you should have a window that shows you the different screen options. And you just. Right. The only problem off. is it doesn't say what they are. Hmm. If you click on the first one, it will show the your main screen or your desk. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, that's kind of interesting. That didn't work. No, <laughs> <laughs> nope, that didn't work. Well, I don't know what to say about that. We did this once before, but I... Uh, Just click click on share, uh, share screen and share. Okay. Allow Zoom to share your screen. Okay. But once you need to say open system preferences, and then privacy default general, maybe that's... No, that's your, that's your settings command. Yeah, that's not what we want to be. Well, rats. Now I've lost the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I can still uh, see you, so you're still there. Well, hmm. it's when I get into the multiple screens, Dave. That's when I, yeah, I can't ever remember where my arrow is, and I'm always looking at what screen it's on. So. Yeah, so maybe you can go to the next one and I'll scratch okay. my head here. You, you check out and see if you can find a way. Uh, Mark, Mark Turner, I'm going to you now. Okay. Well, for Mother's Day, I made a, a bud base. This is, this is elm. And then again, just did a natural finish on the, with the beel. And then um, 
made a bunch of tulips like this. This was the first one, so I didn't really, I should have curved that a little bit more there just by drilling it out with a Forstner bit and then taking a quarter inch um, uh, bit uh, for the for the dowel to fit okay. in. Okay. Very and this cool. Is just, yeah. They have a fit? I'm sorry? It doesn't have a fit? It looked like you were smelling it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, um, it's a it's a very natural uh, sort of a sort of woody scent to it. You know, uh, uh, very forest. Yeah. <laughs> very forest. <laughs> All right. Or you can know if you you know you can always put it in here. There you go. <laughs> if it's elm, we know what it really smells like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you definitely smell that elm when you're sure to do. <laughs> All right, uh, Anthony, I got you next on the list. What do you got to show us? Um, <clears throat> I have uh, another box. It's a uh, mushroom box, and it's uh, uh, made out of a branch. And it's also made as a uh, cap style, so the bottom fits into the top. Oh, oh, there we go. The bottom or the top fits into the bottom rather than uh, over it. Oh, okay. Cool. That's all. Very cool. All right. Thank you. Um, let's see. Dave, did you figure anything out yet? Well, I'm hung up with sharing the screen, and I don't know if we can and try. I guess we can try it. Hold on a second. I've got to put in a keyword here. All right. It, it's telling me that it wants to share the screen and it's locked out right at the moment. Okay. Um, hmm. Let's try what happens with share screen and see what happens again. Okay. And. I've got this whole big option up here. It, I'll just say share and see what happens. And it keeps pushing me back to to grant access. And this is, I got a new computer and that's what I'm kind of lost on here. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, here, I'm going to move on then. You keep yeah, trying I'll, to see what you can do. Hang on. Yeah. Thank All you. All right. No problem. Rick Bywater, what do you got to show us this month? I'm just going to show you exactly what I've been up to for the last six weeks. And hopefully this will, you can see all this stuff. <laughs> um, I've either done lots of big nuts and bolts, and I mean real big. Rick, can you, can you uh, make your uh, position steady so it won't be blur blurry? Well, I'm just moving the, uh-oh. Uh yeah, don't move your hand. We can see it, but... Uh... Yeah, show oh. it again. Rick needs to talk, so it'll be full screen. Oh, Rick, yeah, I think his... Uh... Your voice is not coming through for some reason, Rick. Hey, hang on a second. Now I can kind of hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, so if I hit share screen, what happens? Um, we'll show you, give you. But you probably want to, to show your camera, correct? I'm just going to just do this again, and hopefully you can see it all. Yeah, we can see it. Just be steady on your... <laughs> okay. And then talk a little bit and it'll pop into our main screen. Rick, say something. Yeah? Yeah, go ahead. A lot of Keep those are just solid nuts and bolts. Uh, and then also I started, I started turning... Uh, my neighbor cut down a walnut tree, and so it's just a nice kind of a nice platter with a carved foot. Can you see the foot? I don't know if 
you can see that or not. Yeah, I can see it. I'm, I'm, it scares me to death to think of that thing spinning on the lathe, though. It had to be. Here's another one. <laughs> this, this one, this, this one I call a pro propeller. It's just, and it's a carved foot as well. Looks like a snowboard. It, it, a skateboard. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Very cool. But anyway, yeah, the, the bark really uh, stayed on because uh, he cut it down before the team started. He, all right. Well, thanks, Rick. I experimented on uh, on making a wing nut. <laughs> It's on a piece of uh, Osage orange. The wing nut's made out of oak, and uh, and it's hollowed. I didn't think you could thread oak. I didn't think it was dense enough. Hmm. Maybe it has to do. Why I've learned a secret on a lot of my on my nuts. Um, there are six segments. What I mean by that is. This is a piece of uh, Oh, uh, we're not catching. Uh, is everybody else having problems hearing him? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Rick, you're kind of coming in and out on on sound. Sorry. He has I'll a jump dynamic. Off. He has a dynamic mic. He needs to talk constantly. So he needs to be making some kind of a sound all the time. Oh, so it keeps up and, and keeps picking him mind. up. Yeah. Okay. Well, we saw it. Thanks, Rick. Over and out. <laughs> all right. Um, let's see. And I'm going to go to you next. What do we got this month? Um, I experimented with off-center turning. So I started out with just making some little weed pots or twig pots, and I have some that are smaller and taller and this is over a little bit more but I learned a lot and that was fun. So then I thought I wanted to try to do an off-center bowl. So I had a piece of sycamore and I turned this, painted the inside and then to cover the holes in the bottom I put in a plug and painted it also. What holes in the bottom? What? What holes? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good job. Those are very beautiful. I, I like that. Uh, did you drill the hole for the bud base or did you turn? Um, what, no, no, I drilled that. You yeah. drilled that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. It's very unusual looking. It was, it was real easy and I thought that this would be something that would be an item for another show. Sure. When we get around yeah. to doing it, so yeah. Yeah, it catches the eye. It's well, it's different than just doing it on one one axis. Sure, looks good. Thank you, Ann. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I've got a hand up for phone number nine one three two seven one three five three nine. Go ahead and start talking. I think you'll take over the main screen. I think that's Mike Erickson. He needs yeah, to Mike, you're muted. There you go. Well, there he went. There he is. Uh, okay, I can't see anything. We can hear you and see you. We can? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So I don't know how this is going to work. I'm looking right at your face. Okay. There you go. This? Oh, wing box. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Another so one of those skateboards. It's got a bowl in the middle of it. Yeah. And then I put a bowl in it and I made it so that it, I wanted it so the four corners sits on the table. And it's dried out a little bit, so it doesn't quite do that. And then I make one out of a uh, pear. And then I uh, 
used a scraper to make the uh, accent pieces in it. And then I've been doing some resin work. So here's my pine cone with a Wingate finial on it. You see the inside. Very cool. And then I made another top out of maple with part of the resin and the pine cone. And it also fits on the top. And then I made a vase out of maple and 261 popsicle sticks for the colored banding. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and hollowed it out. And so that was uh, interesting. That was a step away from the colored pencils? Yeah. Um, here's, I've been making all kinds of stuff, but here's, I think this is one of the favorite colored pencil projects I've ever made. Um, it's a box. And there's the inside. But from the outside, these are uh, shorter pencils that I've used. Just kind of doing some experimentation on it. So I've been pretty busy. That, that, you have been busy. Those are very, very cool. Thanks for sharing tonight. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, Chip, Siski, I saw you earlier, so I know you're here. What do you got to share with us this month? I had to unmute myself. Oh, there you uh, go. I made a functional piece here, if I can get it in the camera. Uh, if you remember, I broke my wrist not long ago. And one of the things that uh, I found to be a problem after I broke my wrist was uh, when you would bump something, you know, give it a love tap. And uh, that didn't work so well for me. It uh, started the carpal tunnel thing. So yeah. uh, to save myself from, from love taps, I made a little mallet. But in the end, I made two different steps with uh, little pieces of, of copper pipe in there a half inch and a three quarter inch. So now when my tail stock moves a little bit, instead of bumping it with my hand, I can put this over the tail stock, gives me just a little more leverage to lock the tail stock tight. I got one of those on the jack for my car. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very good idea. And I know what you mean about bumping your, you know, the palm. I've, I've done that before where you do it just a little bit too hard and all of a sudden your palm is about a week and you're going, what the heck did I do? It's easy to do when you're young and it gets harder as you get old. <laughs> I guess that's it. Good job. Thanks for sharing, Chip. <laughs> Let's call that a cheater bar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it is the cheater bar. Okay, Burke Gallagher, you're up. Okay, I've made a uh, zero coating, uh, just a hollow form. Oh, yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I love the shape. Thank you, yeah, it's one of my favorites. So. Nice, nice curves. Yeah. Tomorrow off. What is that? Cooper's getting stitches tonight. Okay. Huh? Ditches tonight. Oh, he is. She Burke, said, you're the last one that had oh, had your hand up, but I want to make sure that everybody out there has a chance if they had something to share and just didn't know how to raise their hand on on Teams. Go ahead and unmute yourself and say something, and and we'll get you on here. When you get to the last guy, this is Dave Tolly. I'm gonna try it one more time. But <laughs> okay, Dave, everybody. great. Let's try. Luck, Dave. <laughs> Dave, you've got fuzzy. Not bad. <laughs> you had it on the teeth on the showing up to him. <laughs> Chris, you're not waiting on me, are you? I was trying to. Oh, well, I pushed a button one time. I didn't need to crowd oh. that in. Uh, no, go ahead. Well, well, hmm. 
this is just not going to work. I can see the writings on the wall because it's not letting me get to my screen. It wants to. Can use. you hold it up? There, maybe. Did that, something come through? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Now we got your screen. Oh, we got all now, kind of stuff here. Now we got your screen. Yeah, there definitely. There we go. Well, Thank here's the uh, object. This one, <clears throat> I'm not sure what's up on the screen. I, uh, it looks like a three three part whirly game. Yeah. Okay. All right. This is an attempt to make a wind uh, uh, wind driven uh, yard ornament, and this started out as a. If I do another screen, how can I do another screen? Well, well. Hmm. Just pick the uh, the screen should pop to the front that you pick. So if it's up. Just pick the border on it. Okay. That's cool. Like right now, I'm seeing that that three piece with the center, the the part that spins. Okay. Yeah, part, we see the, what you see. So. Yeah, this is a the thir This is a 22 inch edge bowl that's cracked, and basically, I said, "What do you do with edges of a three, of a?" Crack bowl, and there's a crack. Right. Bowl. See that? Did you get a bowl? Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. We're seeing the bowl okay, with the crack. I'll forget all of. It. I'm going to try to find a movie buried in here. So the the, the edges of the uh, bowl that I cut off, it was ten inches tall, and I cut three inches off, and this is the three a three segments from that rim, and. Uh, the trick is, of course, to figure out how to use a magnet to make it spin and uh, how to get the axles and all those good things in there. And I'm trying to basically get to a movie here just to show you that at the end of the day, we got there. Well, hmm, yeah, just a minute. Give me a chance. All right. There should be a movie. Oh, there you go. Yeah. And that's a very gentle breeze. And um, the magnets that are allow this axis to pivot with the wind uh, are buried in the big hub in the center of this on that aluminum stake. And then there are two ball bearings on a shaft that are in the center of the triangle. And then this is all friction fit together and it's made out of Osage orange. And the reason it turns is that the um, aerofoil of the rim was cut diagonally so that if you see the end of those um, uh, uh, arms they're they're triangular so as the air flows over that it creates a force on the back side of the blade and that causes it to turn if you don't have much friction and this big piece of wood on the back end is a counterweight to the pulley or to the propeller so that the magnet isn't bound up that inside so you can just pick that center section up off and there's two opposed magnets in it that allow it to rotate. And thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> no, no problem. So that, that basically catches air like a airplane wing would. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's foils an airfoil. Over it. uh -huh. Very cool. Very you, can't nice. tell that, you can't tell that you're an engineer or anything. Uh, well, <laughs> okay. I'll take that as a fair, fair turn. And, uh, so the suspension part of this is that there's a ball bearing. They're a little half inch. And essentially there's two of those on the opposite ends of a little uh, dowel that is hollowed out to press those uh, bushings in. And then the dowel is actually pressed in the intersex inside of that circle hole that you see. And so then here's the opposed magnet that holds that hub up. Anyway, that, that was fun doing. That is very, very cool. Um, I've seen uh, I've seen your your wind machines before, but um, they always had the metal arms instead of this one that has the wood. That's very cool. Uh, well, thank you very much. Well, thanks for uh, keep it keeping at it until you got got it up there for us to see because that was very neat. I, you always have some of the most unusual things I've ever seen, so I appreciate it. All right. Those, those of you who are still awake and still looking at your screen, I want to thank everybody for 
attending. I think we hit uh, 43 or 48 at our high point tonight for number of attendance, and I think that's pretty fantastic given uh, our current situation and, and finding a way to get out there and see each other and, and share things with each other. Uh, it, it's pretty cool that we have this opportunity, um, that we have this this means. So um, want to thank everybody for their participation. Want to thank everybody for showing up. Um, thanks for your patience with us while we kind of work through some of our team's uh, meeting in experiences and, and learning. Uh, I think we're all learning a little bit every time we get into this. Want to invite everybody to uh, jo join the meeting, the, the video uh, meeting that we'll have next month where Larry, Larry Randolph will, will be doing the demonstration. And um, as we get things ironed out as a club, as a board, we will let you all know how we're going to go about opening the shop back up. But I'm hoping it'll be sooner rather than later. So um, we'll certainly keep everybody posted. Uh, I think everybody wants to get back in there as, as, as much as, as um, as we can, as quickly as we can, but we do obviously need to keep safety in mind. So uh, the board will work through that and we'll let the membership know. Um, I think that's our meeting tonight. I want again, thank everybody for their participation. Linda, the treats were wonderful. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So we yeah, should have good. We'll, we'll be coming for the double stuff Oreos when we get back into the shop. All right. All right, guys. Thank you. Have a great night. Take care. Too. Good night. See you all later. Thank you.